Welcome to the History Den YouTube channel. This is the second video covering the events on the Eastern Front during World War II. Today we look at the second part of Joseph Stalin's rise to power, which will lead us up to World War II. And Stalin reached a level of dominance that made him one of the most powerful dictators in human history. This absolute power allowed him to terrorize his own people for decades. And it was during Stalin's reign that millions of Soviet citizens would be executed, deported to slave labor camps, or starved to death. But in the early 1920s, Stalin was not the only important rising figure. There were several members of Lenin's inner circle that shared power initially in the newly formed Soviet government. Although all craved power, Stalin was the purest of the lot. He had a simple concern for power and fame, but mostly power. Like any party, there were internal disputes. Trotsky advocated for an absolute form of Marxism and formed the extreme left of the party. Trotsky's views on the proletariat resonated with the rank and file and made him a growing and powerful figure within the Soviet government. Trotsky pushed hard for the core mantra of Marxism, which called for collectivization and redistribution of wealth. However, Lenin himself did not believe that all industry could be completely taken over by the government. Lenin believed the fragile economy would collapse without some privatization of industry. And so he formed a plan called the New Economic Plan, and that would allow a minor form of capitalism to take place within the Soviet Union. This led to a serious rift between Lenin and Trotsky. In order to counter the growing power of Trotsky, Lenin turned to Stalin. Lenin viewed Stalin as his greatest ally and maneuvered to have Stalin appointed as general secretary in 1922. And so all this was done to check Trotsky. There were several others, though, within the Soviet government that had immense power. There was Nikolai Bukharin, who represented the right wing of the party and generally supported Lenin's new economic plan. There was also Kamenev, Kalinin, and Zinoviev. They were all members of the Politburo, the most powerful branch in the Central Committee. And it seems these men spent the majority of their waking hours vying for power at the top echelons of the Communist Party. And as it would be proved later, Stalin was far more adept than anyone in this regard. Collectively, they were known as the Old Bolsheviks, the original party members that had helped Lenin usher in the Communist Party as the ultimate power inside Russia. Lenin's health began to seriously deteriorate after 1922. This was the result of two failed assassination attempts in 1918. This pushed Lenin into a form of semi-retirement. It was during this time that Lenin and Stalin began to argue consistently. Stalin even berated Lenin's wife for breaking party rules. Lenin began to realize that he might have made a huge mistake in appointing Stalin to the post of general secretary and began to look at Stalin more as a serious threat than an ally. He was probably too weak to depose Stalin at this point, so he resolved to accomplish that through his last will and testament. In this testament, he directly called for the removal of Stalin from his powerful role as general secretary. Lenin finally succumbed to a heart attack on January 21, 1924. It was at this time that Stalin faced his greatest crisis. Lenin's last testament was supposed to go public, which almost certainly would have ended Stalin's political career. But as is the case of many successful dictators throughout history, luck would be on Stalin's side. The Politburo was still deeply divided. This bitter power struggle was something Stalin was able to exploit with great skill. Many members of the Politburo were still consumed with Trotsky's power and desired to limit it. Zinoviev and other high-ranking officials helped conceal the contents of Lenin's testament. So Stalin had survived his first serious crisis. It seemed only Lenin had the extreme foresight to realize the great threat Stalin had become. And because of their help, Stalin formed a troika with Zinoviev and Kamenev. In assisting Stalin, they made a serious lapse in judgment, and it would cost them their lives a decade later. With this troika in place, they were able to defeat Trotsky in 1924. However, in 1925, Stalin actually quelled an attempt to have Trotsky completely expelled from the Communist Party. Stalin now attempted to play the role as peacemaker between the left and the right. He was extremely adept at playing everybody off each other while using his own power as general secretary to appoint his own diehard cronies to powerful positions. With Trotsky now out of the picture, the Zinoviev-Kamenev-Stalin troika disintegrated in 1925. 
Later in that year, both sides attempted to solicit as much support as possible. Stalin sought out Bukharin as his ally and anyone else that could keep him from losing power. In late 1925, Stalin defeated a resolution by Kamenev to have Stalin removed from his post as general secretary. With the defeat of Kamenev, it was clear that Stalin was beginning to win these intra-party battles. He was still many years away from achieving absolute power, but he now was the most important person inside the Kremlin. In 1926, a last-ditch effort was organized to confront Stalin's growing power. Kamenev and Zinoviev set aside their differences with Trotsky and formed what was called the United Opposition. And at the party conference in October of 1926, this troika was easily defeated by Stalin. And with that, Stalin quickly had Trotsky, Kamenev, and Zinoviev first removed from the Politburo, then the Central Committee, and finally even the Communist Party itself. One year later, in 1928, Trotsky was finally deported. Over the next several years, much of the opposition would be forced to submit to Stalin. After the Stalin-Bukharin alliance defeated the united opposition, the Politburo began to focus more on internal matters. Bukharin had attained a great deal of power and was a huge supporter of Lenin's new economic plan. Stalin, too, initially supported Lenin's NEP, but a grain shortage in 1928 would change all of that. Stalin wanted to scrap the NEP and confiscate the grain in a forced collectivization. In a great ironic twist of fate, these were the very same policies that Trotsky had advocated. Bukharin disagreed with Stalin and opposed collectivization. Bukharin preferred a much more gentle approach in dealing with the kulaks and farmers. He believed it was much more worthwhile to have the farmers be somewhat prosperous. Although Bukharin had the support of the Politburo, Stalin was far more adept politically than Bukharin. Stalin removed many of Bukharin's allies, and finally Bukharin was removed from the Politburo in 1929. With Bukharin gone, that was the last serious threat to Stalin's rule, and these would be the last public disagreements with Stalin. With Bukharin defeated, Stalin instituted his brutal plan of forced collectivization. Kulaks could no longer sell their surplus on the open market. Instead, all of their grain was requisitioned by the Soviet government. The individual landowner was no more, and instead their farms were placed under a single massive entity. Although collectivization in theory was designed to increase output, it had quite the opposite effect. Outputs declined, and eventually the plan became nothing short of an absolute catastrophe, the very thing Bukharin had predicted. Stalin blamed the farmers and kulaks, who for the most part resisted his policies on collectivization. Stalin responded, as always, by terror and decided to cut off food to any areas that offered even the slightest resistance, especially in the Ukraine, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. Millions of people were forcibly removed from their lands and sent to slave labor camps in remote Siberia. Along the long road, many would perish from disease, starvation, and the extreme cold. The final estimates may never be known, but it is believed that at least 10 million people died as a result of this artificially induced famine. By the early 1930s, Stalin had achieved almost absolute authority over the Soviet Union. Kamenev, Trotsky, Bukharin, and Zinoviev had all been sidelined. Now, the Communist Party held a party congress every three to four years, where a vote was taken to decide who would be the next members of the Central Committee. The members with the fewest negative votes were elected to the Politburo. These had almost become formalities as Stalin was always elected with the fewest votes. But at the 1934 Congress, this would all change and it would have dramatic consequences. Sergei Kirov, a rising star in the Communist Party, received only three negative votes, the fewest of any candidate. Unbelievably, Stalin received over a thousand negative votes. Now, Kirov had advocated a more moderate position in the party. A position that would allow internal dissent. A stunned Stalin quickly had his cronies alter the results of the anonymous vote. The new doctored results now had Stalin with the fewest negative votes. The very party rules that Lenin had created were broken by Stalin. This was the last serious attempt to check Stalin's power. Now Stalin, who was always paranoid about a fifth column, was now nothing short of a borderline schizophrenic, because after this debacle, he felt his role as party leader was threatened. The bold delegates at the 1934 Congress 
Congress would pay a terrible price for their disobedience. Of the nearly 2,000 in attendance, almost two-thirds were put to death, and these events would lead to the Great Purge. The first to go was Sergei Kirov, and this was the start of the Great Purge. Now, after the result of the 1934 Congress, Stalin promised to place Kirov on the Politburo, but he consistently delayed the appointment. Since Kirov represented the last serious threat to Stalin's power, he had to be eliminated. Kirov was quickly assassinated in late 1934. Because of Kirov's immense popularity, Stalin could not simply have had Kirov arrested and shot. It seems now that Kirov's murder was carefully orchestrated by the NVKD at Stalin's behest. The assassin was quickly identified as Nikolaev. He was quickly killed by Stalin's henchmen after Kirov's murder, thus eliminating any possible connection to Stalin. Stalin used Kirov's murder to blame all of his opponents, though scholar Boris Nikolaevsky wrote, One thing is certain, the only man who profited by the Kirov assassination was Stalin. Now, Kirov's predicament is noteworthy in that he was, in fact, very loyal to Stalin and had no plans for a coup. Nonetheless, Kirov's death marked the start of the Great Purge, in which thousands of Soviet citizens were either executed or deported. Higher profile figures were given show trials, which were a complete farce. The evidence presented was a complete sham, often relying on the flimsiest of information. The accused had no defense counsel and no right of appeal. Many were beaten into submission and tortured into signing confessions. The favored verdicts of these trials was always guilty. Years later, as the Soviet archives were opened up, many of these signed confessions literally were covered with the defendant's own blood. And so, there was immense public outrage over Kirov's murder, and this gave Stalin the opportunity to settle old scores. This involved anyone in the past that had even the slightest disputes with Stalin. As one party leader put it, the boss forgets nothing. The main instrument of Stalin's terror was the NVKD, the secret police of the Soviet Union. The head of the NVKD was Yagoda. He was given the task of supervising the arrest and trials of many of the old Bolsheviks. Kamenev and Zinoviev were implicated by the NVKD in Kirov's murder and promptly arrested. They were put through a series of show trials that culminated in the trial of the 16. These former party leaders confessed not only to Kirov's murder, but to many other crimes such as spying and sabotage. They were also charged with adhering to Trotskyism, by now a crime in Stalin's world. Kamenev and Zinoviev were judged guilty and shot on August 25, 1936. Stalin had made a complete mockery of Lenin's sacred rule against killing party comrades. Amazingly, the NVKD leader Yagoda himself was arrested. His replacement, Yezov, had Yagoda stripped naked, beaten, and summarily shot. Yagoda's only crime, it seems now, was that he had been too slow in eliminating the old Bolsheviks. And for the Soviet citizens, things could not have gotten any worse than they already were, as Yezov was even more brutal than his mentor. Over a million people were arrested. Yezov wrote coldly, better than ten innocent people should suffer than one spy get away. And for those lucky enough not to be executed, many were sent to the remotest regions of the Soviet Union, to the gulags. And here they would be literally worked to death. Often the ability to survive depended on simple things such as having dry clothes. After the political purges, the military's turn was next. Field Marshal Mikhail Tukhashevsky was arrested in 1937. Tukhashevsky had become one of the most prominent military theorists in the Red Army. He advocated for a modern army complete with tanks and airplanes. He was a leading tactician in the Red Army. Tukhashevsky, along with several other top generals, were dragged in front of a special military tribunal on June 11, 1937. The charges were so outrageous that Tukhashevsky said, I feel I am dreaming. Not surprisingly, the generals were all found guilty and eliminated that day. The judges themselves were also military generals, and many were given the brutal option of either being judge or defendant. And not surprisingly, many of these judges were also arrested shortly after Tukhashevsky's trial and shot. In addition, thousands of other junior officers were also put to death. One of the last old Bolsheviks to go was Bukharin. Following the executions of Zinoviev and Kamenev in 1936, Bukharin was arrested on February 27, 1937. Stalin sent him on a trip to Paris just a year earlier, but Bukharin suspected he would soon be arrested by Stalin. He told his friends he believed the whole trip was a trap, and indeed many of his contacts were featured prominently at his trial. To another friend he confided, now he is going to kill me. 
Yet he made no attempt to flee while in France. He told his wife that he could never live outside of the Soviet Union. Bukharin seemed resigned to his fate and returned to the Soviet Union, where he was in fact arrested. While in prison, Bukharin wrote several books. He even sent a private note to Stalin asking the dictator why he wanted him dead. Bukharin's trial began in March of 1938. Even more than the earlier show trials, Bukharin's trial became even more absurd, with the charges completely outlandish and unbelievable. The prosecution now alleged that Bukharin and others sought to assassinate Lenin and Stalin, murder Maxim Gorky, and carve up the Soviet Union and give the territories to Germany, Japan, and Britain. Bukharin was found guilty and awaited his execution. Many communists from around the world outside of the Soviet Union pleaded for Bukharin's life, but none of that made any difference as Bukharin was executed on March 15, 1938. This was the last straw for many communists in other countries, as they now saw Stalin as a thug and murderer. In fact, many would become fervent anti-communists. After Bukharin's execution in 1938, the purges began to wane. Stalin was now focused on external events. In a likely attempt to disconnect himself from the purges, he had Yezov arrested. Stalin was also undoubtedly paranoid of the immense power the leader of the NVKD possessed. Yezov had been the main executor of the Great Purge, and now he was about to become one of its countless victims. The irony could not have been lost on Yezov. He was replaced by Berea. Berea had Yezov stripped naked, humiliated, and then executed in the exact way Yezov had his mentor executed. Interestingly, Berea had been a target of Yezov during the purges, no doubt to eliminate a potential rival. After a direct plea to Stalin himself, Berea's life was spared, and he was able to turn the situation around against Yezov. Berea would remain in charge of the NVKD until 1953. After Stalin's death in that year, the army took its revenge on the NVKD by arresting Berea. They had not forgotten about those military purges, and so Berea was given a quick trial and promptly executed. Interestingly, all three NVKD leaders were executed in the same format that they had promoted so vigorously, and each one before their execution had begged for mercy. Berea's death was the last political execution of the Soviet Union, as it moved into a period known as de-Stalinization, eliminating many of Stalin's policies. No one knows exactly how many people died under Stalin's rule. The modern S estimates place it close to 20 million people. It remains to this day one of the worst acts of genocide in human history, and it certainly left his country dangerously exposed to the rising menace of Nazi Germany. And so in the next video, we will get to the start of World War II on the Eastern Front.